Okay, welcome to this video. In this video, we are going to consider a topic of significant importance to analytical chemistry, and this topic is called the method of standard additions. Standard additions is a method in which you can do internal calibration within the sample, and as we shall see, it's useful for accounting for something called matrix effects. That's its purpose, okay? I would rate this in importance of three and a half or so out of four stars and say that you're likely to encounter it somewhere in your analytical chemistry course in the form of a graded question. Now, first off, standard additions is a form of calibration, but it's internal calibration. Instead of making a calibration curve from external standards, we're going to standardize within the sample matrix itself. And that's actually pretty important because we're going to use this method when the sample matrix is complex or unknown. Now first off, if you've forgotten what the sample matrix is, it's essentially everything else in the sample except for the analyte, the substance you're trying to measure. If that's very complicated, it's entirely possible that other molecules in the sample matrix might interfere in the analysis. This might affect sensitivity in some way, making the method either less sensitive or more sensitive. If that happens, if you reference to external calibration points for your calibration, your result is likely to be inaccurate because the sensitivity of the method is different in the sample matrix compared to external set of samples. We can overcome this challenge by internal calibration or carrying out the method of standard additions. Therefore, this standard additions method is important because it can overcome these matrix effects. We're able to use this method if our detector response is linear with concentration, which is a requirement. And also, we can achieve a zero intercept on our, uh, or a zero response on our detector when no analyte is present. That's also important. Let's see how this works. There are traditionally two approaches to the method of standard additions. This video is going to consider the first of the two, and there'll be another video for the second. I've chosen to separate two videos um, in the interest of time to prevent this one being overly long. The methods differ in whether or not we're going to do a single addition or multiple point addition. This video is going to consider only the single point addition. Again, look for the other video because that's also important under this topic. If I'm considering only the single point method for standard additions, the analysis would work something like this. We would take our original sample, we'd prepare it, get ready to analyze it, and then we would subject it to analysis using the technique. Now here I've drawn that just as a black box with a number in it. That number is representative of the signal that our black box detector records. It's not important whether this is a spectrophotometer or a chromatograph or whatever other uh, analysis technique. Right now, it's just a device that produces a signal that's linearly proportional to the analyte's concentration in our sample. So we analyze our sample, produces a response. We give that response the symbol S sub S, okay, our sample response, our sample signal. After that analysis step, we then spike that original sample. We spike it. Now what does that mean? What it means in chemistry is we add a known quantity of our analyte into that sample. So we analyze it, and then we purposely add more analyte to increase the analyte's concentration. We do this through addition of a standard solution, usually a, a fixed volume or a set volume, a known volume of a standard solution. In this particular example problem that we're going to work, I'm going to say that the spike is 5 milliliters of 15 millimolar analyte. Okay, so we would prepare this from a standard, it would be a known concentration, and we would pipe it some in to our sample. Mix it up really well to, to make it homogeneous. And then, after the spike step, we analyze the sample again using the exact same method we did before, and record the new response. The new response here, algebraically, I'm going to call capital S with the subscript S plus X. This is the signal for the spiked sample. Without the X is the signal for the sample alone. So in our example, you can see that the signal has increased, as it should, if we spike in 
A decent amount of analyte from a standard solution, we've increased the concentration, and consequ consequently, if the detector is working right, the signal would be expected to increase. Now what we're going to do is we're going to track these increases, and from the knowledge of the known amount of analyte that we added in this step, the known volume and concentration, I can compute how many moles I've added. So from the delta signal, or the change in signal, and from the change in concentration, because I know the volumes involved of everything, I can actually compute what the concentration must have been in the original sample to produce the signal that I observed. And that's what this is all about, okay? Now mathematically, how does that work? Well, that's going to be shown down here at the bottom of this slide. So I focused your attention on that. This equation right here is known as the standard additions equation for single point analysis. And you can see it's just a ratio, two ratios equal to one another, okay? Mathematically, there's a lot of variables here, but this is a pretty simple statement, okay? What we have on the right side is the ratio of our S's. S sub S divided by S sub S plus X. That's the signal ratio. Basically, the ratio of the signals at our detector. Now, on the left side, we've got another ratio, but this ratio is going to involve concentrations. X sub I is going to be the analyte concentration in the original sample, what was present in our original sample, that's the unknown in this experiment, always going to be unknown. The X sub F is also the analyte concentration, but this number is going to be a little bit different, a little bit smaller than X sub I. And the reason why that is, is because this is the final concentration of the analyte after the dilution. So um, it, it's essentially the concentration of the analyte which was present from the original sample after we dilute it via the spike. Okay, I'll show how that works in a second. And the second number, the S sub F, well that's going to be the concentration of the spike after accounting for the dilution in, in this mix, okay? So what we can do then is, in this denominator, break down these two terms which are probably kind of confusing, and hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense to you when we break them down here in this equation that's on the bottom of the slide. So you can see what we've done is I've essentially expanded this term and this term into two other terms. Now I'm using x sub i instead of x sub f. But to do that, I need to multiply my x sub i by this volume ratio, which is v0 divided by v. And you can see what that is if you look at this, okay? v0 is the volume of the original sample. That's the 100 mil sample here. And the v, without the subscript, is the total volume after the spike, okay? So that would be 100 divided by 105 here. Because our spike is 5 milliliters, so I'm assuming if I add 100 plus 5, I get 105. Um, doesn't always work that way, but I'm going to assume that for this problem. So this ratio would be 100 to 105. So you're accounting for, what you're doing with this number in this ratio is you're accounting for the dilution of the analyte that was present in the original sample. And that's basically all, all you're doing, okay? So you're going to add that concentration to what you added from adding the spike. Okay, now the spike was 5 mils of 15 millimolar, okay, but you're not adding 15 millimolar because you only added 5 mils of that. You've got to account for the dilution into this original 100 mils. So how do you do that? Well, you set up another volume ratio, but here it's Vs divided by V, where Vs is the volume of the spike and V is the total volume. Okay, so you multiply that ratio by the original concentration of the spike. Note here it's Si and not Sf anymore. That's the original concentration of the analyte in the solution, the standard solution that you spike into this mix, okay? So if I prepared a standard of 15 millimolar and I spike in 5 milliliters, the 15 millimolar, which is my standard solution I used to spike in, I prepared that externally, that is my S sub I, okay? V sub S is the volume of the spike, that'd be 5 mils here and V is the V total. That's after the addition, so that would be 105. All right, so if you think about this ratio business long enough, what you can see here is over here I've got a ratio of my signals before and after the spike. And here I've got a ratio of my analyte concentrations before and after the spike. 
So this makes a lot of sense. If your signal is linearly proportional to the analyte concentration and your detector produces zero signal at zero concentration, this has to be true, basically. Okay, it's got to be true. The ratio of the concentrations has to equal the ratio of the signals. And that's all that we're doing here algebraically. So it looks really confusing, um, but it's really a, a pretty simple state, statement of truth, okay? All right, so what I'd like to do now is use this equation and use the specifics of this problem up here to actually work through a sample problem with you, just to show how this might work. And given this analysis, that is the original 100 mil sample, the original uh, response of 0.673, the 5 milliliter spike of 15 millimolar, and the final signal of 0.841, I'd like to use, work through this math and figure out what the analyte concentration was in this original sample. Essentially what I'm asking is, what in the world was X sub I in that sample, what the analyte concentration was there? So we can do this. Not a big deal. So what I'd like to do first, or what I like to do first, is look at the right side. of the expression. That was that signal ratio. The reason why I like to look at that side first is it's usually pretty easy to reduce it pretty quickly. So in this particular example problem, the ratio of our signals at our detector, this one was 0.673, this one was 0.841 after the spike. So of course that's what these numbers correspond to. So I plug in my signals here and here. Very quickly then, I can do the division on my calculator and come up with a decimal number that represents the signal ratio. So my signal ratio was 0.8002. So I like to clean that right side up as quick as I can, basically, okay? Now with that done, I can return to that uglier fraction, which is over on the left-hand side. Remember the X sub I term, that's the concentration of the analyte in the original sample, is in the numerator. We can't really plug anything in there yet. That's always going to be our unknown, okay? So we're going to write that as our algebraic variable. And then in the denominator, what we're going to do is use the second form of the equation that we talked about before, where we have the X sub I and the S sub I. Um, because we know these volumes and we certainly know the standard concentration, so we're going to be able to plug in numbers and rearrange and solve for the X sub I terms. Okay, that's going to be our strategy. So let us do that. In the denominator, we have another X sub I term that appears. This is for the dilution, remember, of whatever was in that original sample. And remember, we had a volume ratio here, right? What was that volume ratio? What was the, the original volume, which was 100 milliliters, ratioed to the final volume? Which in this case, we added a spike of 5 milliliters. So it's 100 divided by 105. That accounts for dilution of the analyte in the original sample. So the new concentration after the dilution is equal to that. We're going to add that number, what was originally present, to whatever we spiked in. And recall, the concentration was one term, the S sub I. That was 15 millimolar in this case. That was stated in the problem. You can look back on the previous piece of paper here um, in the video if you want. Then we have to multiply that by a suitable dilution factor, um, the ratio of volumes. And you recall what was important there was the volume of the spike ratioed to the total. We used a 5 milliliter spike. After the spike, the total volume of everything is 105 again. So if I multiply that volume mixing ratio by this concentration, this number right here on the right of the plus sign tells me what concentration I've added to the original sample by virtue of spiking it. Okay? So you can see where we're going here, or where we're headed. We've got a number over on the right of the equal sign. We've only got one variable on the left, so we should be able to rearrange and solve this equation. Of 
before we do that, however, I like to clean up the mathematics a little bit. So if I do this ratio, I'll get this 0.9524 business, okay? And that's, of course, multiplied by the x sub i still. It hasn't gone anywhere. I guess I should write the square brackets denoting the concentration. And then if I do this ratio times this number, I end up getting 0.71428. And, of course, that whole thing equals the signal ratio, which was still a little over 0.8. Right, so that's a little bit prettier now that I've combined numbers and simplified things uh, mathematically. If I wanted to proceed from here, what I would do is take this entire denominator of the fraction and multiply both sides by that number, or that uh, denominator, I should say. That would clear the left-hand side, and all I'd be left with was x sub i, because if I multiply this side by the denominator, it would cancel each other out. And then, of course, on the right side, what I would need to do is this number times this denominator, okay? And if I distribute that out, what I end up getting is 0 0.76213 x sub i plus 0 0.57159 if I multiply that by that, okay? So that times that x i and that times that um, is my number there. Alright, so I'm making a lot of progress here. I'm reducing this down, and all I, all I really need to do now is to basically move this over here, because this is like 1 uh, x sub i, right? So if I do that, I have 0 0.23787 x sub i. And of course, I did that by uh, subtracting this from both sides. So I move it over here. This is 1 x sub i. So 1 x sub i minus that is equal to this. Okay. And that is going to still equal this uh, 0.57159 number. All right. So hopefully all that makes sense. It's just some algebraic manipulations there. And then, of course, all I need to do to find my answer solve the equation for x sub i, that original concentration, which is going to result from this division step. And the units are going to be the same as the units I used in that original concentration, which here was 15. Okay? All right, so hopefully everybody sees it. I'll zoom in here just a little bit in case you can't see the numbers. So solving this equation for x sub i yielded 2.4 millimoles per liter. That represents the original concentration in my unknown sample way back here in the problem. So all I did is I tracked the increase in signal, set up a ratio, and solved for the x sub i, the concentration in the original that must have been present to have that ratio reflected in my results if my spike was 5 milliliters of 15 millimolar. Okay? Essentially that's all that problem was all about. So, my hope is, is that you have understood the basic principles of standard additions, how it works experimentally, that is spiking the sample. You also need to know why you would want to use standard additions. That's also very important. That's to overcome the matrix effect. It's the internal calibration. And lastly, you've now seen one example problem of a single point addition and how to solve for the unknown concentration in that sample problem. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Don't forget to watch the second video in this series on standard additions. That is a graphical procedure in which the analyst performs more than one spike.